Hi, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Kramer from the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre. Thank you so much for joining us for this Politics in Action question and answer session. Our special guest for this particular session is Dr. Kieran Sims from James Cook University, who gave us uh, a wonderful video background last week on the current political situation in Laos. If you haven't had a chance to watch his video yet, you can go to the Sydney Southeast Asia Facebook page or our YouTube channel to watch it there. Um, so thank you so much, Kieran, for um, giving us the opportunity to ask you some questions today. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so I have a handful of questions that have been sent in by some of uh, our viewers who watched your video last week um, that I would like to get your perspective on as well. Um, so let me get straight into it with our first question, which reads, uh, what do you think is the political effect of increased Chinese investment in Laos? Would you see Laos pivot more towards China rather than its traditional back of Vietnam at this time when ASEAN unity is undermined by members' conflicting interests and different attitudes towards China's inclusion? Okay, great, thanks. Um, the first part of the question is quite broad, uh, and I don't think there is a singular political effect as such. I think that's important to recognise. There are many effects, uh, and these effects change as China, like any country, tries to leverage the influence that's gained through its investment to try and shape different outcomes in different circumstances or around different issues or events, uh, you know, to its benefit. Um, Definitely the political relationship between the Chinese Communist Party and the Lao government seems to be improving. Uh, this increases China's geopolitical leverage in and beyond mainland Southeast Asia, of course. Um, but the government of Laos also has historically been quite successful at maintaining political relationships with states that have competing geopolitical ambitions. So it's had successful relationships with China, Japan, Russia, United States, Australia, Vietnam and others um, for quite a long time. The question of is Lao pivoting more to China than to Vietnam? I don't think the Lao government sees it this way. I think it's trying to gain as much as it possibly can from all of its different diplomatic partners. The Lao government's um, relationship with China and Vietnam is a bit different. And I definitely think overall there is a bit more hidden suspicion or at least wariness towards China than there is to Vietnam. Uh, the solidarity between the Lao and the Vietnamese parties, which was forged or at least strengthened during the second Indochina war. And there's a lot of legacies to that and it lives on today in important ways. Um, um, but um, that being said, there's only been, as a brief example, there's only been two occasions in the history of ASEAN where a joint communique wasn't reached at the end of an ASEAN summit. The first one was in 2012, and that was when Cambodia was the ASEAN chair. And the failure was the result of an inability to reach consensus around questions about the South China Sea, where China has disputes with Vietnam and the Philippines. Um, the second time was in 2016. That's when Lao was chair of ASEAN. Um, and a, a resolution was eventually reached on that occasion, but there was delays in the process. So, Yes, I do think China's growing political economic influence in Laos presents a challenge to ASEAN unity. And I think it's reasonable to speculate that the Chinese Communist Party is pursuing a strategic agenda um, that does weaken ASEAN unity through its relationships with Laos and Cambodia. But I'd also emphasise that relationships between the countries are much more complex than that singular issue. So you want to be a bit careful about viewing China Lao relationships only through any singular lens, in, including one that sort of overemphasizes China ASEAN geopolitics. Great. Thanks for that response, Kieran. The second question that I have here um, reads, you mentioned in your presentation that Ton Lun had launched an anti-corruption campaign over the last year in Laos. What has this looked like and how effective has it been? And um, is there anything, is this anything beyond a PR exercise for the government? Yeah, it's an important question. Uh, it's also a difficult one to answer. Uh, so the reforms that I referred to weren't over the last year. Uh, they, were, they were a few years back actually. 
Um, and as I mentioned, they stalled since then. How effective were they? I haven't studied them closely to be able to comment on the specifics. Um, but if we look at the reform targeting corruption as an example, uh, there seems to have been fairly limited impact. Um, whether or not they were anything beyond a, a government PR exercise is a good question, um, but it's difficult to know. The cynical side of me tends to say that it probably was a PR exercise, um, but politics is very complicated. So I don't know what Ton Lund's motivations were, and I, and I can't say for certain why the reforms have stalled. Um, the fact that they were quite short-lived suggests that possibly they were just a PR exercise, um, but they may have been stopped for other reasons too. So political change is not an easy thing to implement in authoritarian states and may not always be successful the first time around. And I think we need to remember that. I would say that if we don't see further reforms following the next party Congress next year, uh, then it's pretty fair to say that whatever the motivation was for the initial reforms, there's, there's, pretty, there's little desire now for political change within the government. Okay, thanks. Um, the next question that I have here reads, can you please tell us more about the education system in Laos, especially in terms of gender equality and gender equity? Um, and a follow on to that, how has COVID-19 affected the education of Lao people in the Lao PDR? So I can't really comment on gender equity in Laos education system. It's not something that I've looked at. Um, I can say broadly that Laos is quite a patriarchal society in many ways. Uh, and when families have limited opportunities to send their children to school, boys' educations are often privileged over girls. Um, but beyond that, I don't know much about the complexities of gender parity in the education system. In regards to the education system more broadly, um, I think the question is a good opportunity to draw attention to some of the really fantastic community-oriented learning programs that we've seen in Laos. Um, those that were established and delivered by Sombat Sompon uh, and the organisation that he set up, PADEC. So this was work that focused on youth leadership, culturally sensitive learning um, and embedding schooling within community systems. I've written about that in the past and the, the PADEC website is still up. Um, so there's more information on those programs there for people to learn more about it. At the higher education level, the National University of Laos or NUOL, which is based in Vientiane, is the country's leading higher education institution. It's generally considered to be of a, sl a slightly lower standard than other leading national universities across ASEAN, um, but it's also worth mentioning that its international partnerships are growing um, and partners, regional partners in particular, like Thailand, Vietnam and China, are providing a range of capacity building inputs into the university. Um, international scholarships have also been an important contributor to the education of Laos students. So Australia's long provided university scholarships to Laos. Um, and in recent years, we're seeing an increasing number of students uh, and professionals traveling to China on scholarships um, and to other parts of the region to study. How COVID-19 affects education. Um, on the whole, my understanding is that the effect to date has been minimal, um, but that might change, of course. Um, and again, I haven't, looked closely into this, so there might be some significant effects that I'm not aware of. But overall, I think Laos responded quite well to COVID-19 and, and that's um, been true of, of education as well. Great. And my final question for you here, could you tell us about the ramifications of the pandemic on Lao migrant workers in the region and how this pandemic might impact their rights? Yeah. Um, so these are really important questions. I think most people are aware that even in times of peace and prosperity, um, migrant workers in Southeast Asia and in other parts of the world um, have very precarious lives. Um, so they have job insecurity, limited rights, limited freedoms, um, often little or no access to healthcare, heightened vulnerability to state violence and non-state violence um, and so on. Right. So. So at a very basic level, this means that um, during a pandemic, 
migrant workers have very little leverage in trying to negotiate safer work conditions, implement things like social distancing. They generally lack state welfare support, um, which would enable them to stop working even if their employers supported that decision. Um, they're less likely to seek out healthcare, whether it's due to cost or whether it's due to risk of um, facing persecution or prosecution by authorities. Um, and if their migration pathways were illicit, as a lot of migration in Southeast Asia and mainland Southeast Asia is, um, that it might actually be really difficult for them to return home during the pandemic. It's not straightforward. Um, if they do have the means to go home, financial or otherwise, um, that travel, of course, increases their risk of exposure to COVID-19 as they get on busy buses and other modes of transport, as they get processed through quarantine centres, all those sorts of things. Um, so I read recently um, some different estimates, but um, one was around 80,000 migrant workers that have left Thailand during um, the pandemic to head back to, to Cambodia, Laos um, and Myanmar. One report um, put it as high as 700,000, in fact. Um, so I'm not sure where the correct figure is. Um, and I think Focus on the Global South is one organisation that's been looking into that issue that people could follow up further with. Um, I also recently read that the Immigration Department for Vientiane Municipality has reported more than 4,700 Lao migrants crossing the Thai Lao um, Friendship Bridge. Um, following the announcement of lockdown measures and, and the pandemic's emergence. Um, so in addition to the effects of the pandemic on migrants, this mass movement of peoples across the region, mainly in Southeast Asia, also presents really significant challenges for containing the spread of the virus. Um, so Lao migrant workers are, are a vulnerable population and that vulnerability I think has been heightened by the pandemic. The ramifications, you know, to go back to the original question, um, the ramifications are, are really ongoing and there's lots that we will wait to see. Um, but I think definitely we can say that the need for further support and protection of migrant workers, um, whether they're Lao, whether they're Cambodian, Burmese or, or others, it's something that the international community, I think, really needs to provide some support for and additional support for. Okay, um, that was my last question for you, Kieran. So thank you so much for your time and your willingness to be a part of our Virtual Politics in Action program. Thank you, Liz, and uh, thank you again to CEAP for giving me the opportunity to be involved. Excellent. And for our viewers, if you would like to watch or re-watch Kieran's expert analysis, um, or share it with your friends, you can head over to our Facebook page, uh, the Sydney Southeast Asia Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And while you're there, you can also check out some of our other videos on other countries for this year, including Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Vietnam and Indonesia.